let me take you back before. Who wanted to be like Chris Light? Jimmy Henchman? Yeah. What did that. Jimmy Henchman do? You, you Move that. on the same block as, as Chris Lighty? There was offer a proffer agreement, and in that proffer agreement, his name was Jimmy Henchman. 50 Cent is really fed up and making claims left and right, saying there's a big snitch in the music scene. When a big name like him talks about another big figure, Supreme, things get pretty wild. He, he actually projected himself. His lifestyle is consistent. He was true to it. He never ran on nobody, just like that. There's this wild story about him stunning a bunch of experienced detectives by saying he could solve a decade of unsolved crimes in New York in just 10 minutes, which really made them question their skills. How does his brave moves highlight major flaws in the justice system? Let's answer. What powerful truths are being kept from us? I want to apologize to the massive for letting these so ass niggas catch me out there like that. the unseen battles of New York's street kings. Jimmy's story is not just about his actions, but reflects the broader challenges and sometimes the shortcomings of the justice system. It shows how a single person can appear to outsmart an entire team of law enforcement officials, making their efforts seem less significant or effective. His reputation has woven him into the fabric of hip-hop history, not just for alleged criminal activities, but for challenging the authorities so boldly. In this context, Jimmy's actions offer a stark critique of how law enforcement is perceived. They suggest a reactive, rather than proactive approach to crime solving, where the spectacle of catching criminals often overshadows the quieter, perhaps more effective measures of crime prevention. Jimmy, with his audacious claim, highlights how those who are supposed to control crime are sometimes seen as barely keeping up with those they pursue. As we delve deeper into his story, we see a complex figure who not only challenges legal boundaries, but also dares to make a mockery of the system's efforts. This isn't just a story about crime. It's about how one man's alleged deeds have forced us to reconsider our understanding of law enforcement and its effectiveness. It's a reflection on the dynamics of power, perception, and legitimacy within the gritty realities of urban America. Jimmy Henchman's story is like a dark drama filled with danger and tough choices, echoing through the history of hip-hop. Born in Harlem, but raised in Brooklyn's Vander Garden's apartments, Jimmy was thrust early into a life that demanded street smarts and toughness. Raised by a single mother along with four brothers after their father left, Jimmy's home life set him on a path that would deeply influence his future. Jimmy left school early, drawn not by the allure of textbooks and teachers, but by the urgent lessons taught on the streets of Flatbush. He joined a group known as the Untouchables, a name that suggested they could handle anything thrown their way. Even as a young boy, Jimmy's reputation for getting into trouble began to grow, signaling the stormy life he would lead in the music and crime worlds. As he matured, Jimmy's name became synonymous with the term henchman. My name is Jimmy Henchman of Zar Entertainment. Henchman is a name that deals with some kind of dark side. People have taken henchmen to mean different things. He moved through the underbelly of the music industry with a mix of respect and fear from those around him. His role was complex, navigating through both legitimate business and less savory dealings with a sharpness that kept him on top in both worlds. Jimmy's influence is rumored to have unwittingly sparked the infamous East Coast-West Coast rivalry in rap, a conflict that escalated to deadly heights with the murders of rap giants Biggie and Tupac. While it's hard to pinpoint exactly how much Jimmy was responsible for these events, his involvement in the rap scene at this time shows how one person's actions can have far-reaching effects. Adding to his complicated life, there were claims that Jimmy might have been a spy within the industry. But I guess they didn't know how to handle a weapon or something like that. It's in the paperwork. And the gun went off in the car. So as the gun went off in the car, I guess it jammed and they backed out of what they wanted to do. This part of his life shows him as a man who possibly betrayed his peers. Or maybe it was just another strategy to stay alive in a dangerous game. Either way, this aspect of his story adds a layer of complexity to his already complicated life. Jimmy Henchman's life story is a powerful reflection of broader issues within society and the music industry. It's a tale of a man shaped by his harsh surroundings, 
who in turn shaped the culture around him. His journey from the streets to significant influence in the music world is a testament to the gritty reality of survival and ambition. His legacy remains a topic of discussion and analysis, inviting us to look deeper into the forces that mold cultural movements. Jimmy's life story challenges us to consider the realities behind the glamour of hip-hop, the tough decisions, and the harsh realities that artists and executives face behind the scenes. Through his tale, we gain insight into the complexity of human motivations and the profound impact they can have on our cultural landscape. Next, we explore how Jimmy's troubled past leads to darker times, from gunshots to spotlight. Jimmy's life unfolded like a series of unfortunate events, each chapter darker than the last. From a young age, he seemed to be on a path that frequently intersected with the criminal justice system. By just 16 years old, Jimmy had already faced two serious gun crime charges. He spent a year in the harsh environment of Rikers Island, a place that's more a factory of despair than rehabilitation. Freedom briefly graced him, but it was fleeting, lasting less than a year before he found himself entangled with the law once more over another gun-related incident. People said Jimmy was fortunate to post bail this time, but any notion of luck was short-lived. His brief taste of freedom ended abruptly when he was implicated in a murder. In an ironic twist, admitting to possessing a gun during the incident led to the more severe murder charge being dropped. However, justice, or perhaps just the legal system, wasn't finished with him yet. He received a sentence of five to ten years, sealing his fate back behind bars. It was here, in the depths of incarceration, that he met Richard Moore, a former Black Panther leader. Moore wasn't just another inmate. He was a beacon of hope and change. He took an interest in Jimmy, encouraging him to pursue education as a way out of the cycle of crime and punishment. Moore's influence led Jimmy to make a decision that would alter the course of his life. He decided to go back to school while still in prison. The idea of education as a transformative power is often touted, yet the reality in prison is far from ideal. Resources are limited. The environment is far from conducive to learning. And yet, against these odds, Jimmy earned an associate's degree. This achievement, significant as it may be, was more a token of systemic compliance than a true victory over his circumstances. By the time he was released in 1988, Jimmy had a degree and a new outlook, but the scars of his past and the challenges of reintegrating into society lingered. His narrative is one of personal struggle against a backdrop of systemic failure, where society repeatedly fails those like Jimmy, offering little in the way of true support or opportunities for redemption. His journey highlights the broader issue of how the justice system treats those who fall into its grasp, not as individuals to be rehabilitated, but as problems to be managed. Jimmy's story, while filled with personal decisions and pivotal moments, reflects a harsher truth about our societal and judicial constructs. It serves as a reminder of the deep-seated issues within our penal system and the daunting challenges faced by those who seek to break free from its cycle. Jimmy, previously involved in minor criminal activities, didn't leave the shady dealings behind. Instead, he switched his focus to the drug market. For three years, he became heavily involved in the crack trade, showing a knack for business amid the chaos. During this time, a friend suggested he pivot to a new field, the music industry. This was a time when hip-hop was just starting to take center stage culturally. The music scene was buzzing, and the stakes were high with the rise of hip-hop's golden age just around the corner. At this moment, a young rapper named Tupac Shakur began making a name for himself. Although not yet famous, those in the loop recognized Tupac's potential to become a major force in music. Sensing a golden opportunity, Jimmy thought to make a move to manage Tupac, hoping to leverage the rapper's emerging fame to break away from his gritty street life. This is where Haitian Jack comes into the picture. Known to both Jimmy and Tupac, Jack had the connections and influence to make things happen in the music scene. He tried to bring Jimmy and Tupac together, thinking it could be beneficial for both. Despite this promising arrangement, Tupac decided not to team up with Jimmy. This decision might have been influenced by Tupac's intuition about Jimmy's past still being a shadow over his future ambitions. Jimmy's attempt to enter the music business through managing Tupac highlights his ambition to transform his life and make a mark in a new arena. Even though Tupac refused his offer, Jimmy didn't give up on the music industry. Instead, 
he doubled down on his efforts to find a place in this new world. A world just as competitive and tough as the drug market he was familiar with. Jimmy's story is a tale of a man trying to shift his path from the streets to the music studios, aiming to swap illegal activities for legitimate success in a thriving industry. His journey illustrates his struggle to navigate two challenging worlds, each with its own rules and stakes. By aiming to manage a rising star like Tupac, Jimmy sought not only a new identity, but also a new source of power, no longer from the shadows of the street, but from the bright lights of music fame. As Jimmy pursued this new chapter, he exemplified the drive to redefine oneself and achieve relevance in a society that often mixes the gritty realities of street life with the glamorous allure of celebrity culture. This dual pursuit paints a vivid picture of a man on a quest for a new kind of influence, where success is measured by chart rankings and platinum records rather than street credibility alone. His move towards the music business was both a strategy for personal change and a bid to establish a lasting legacy in a rapidly transforming cultural landscape. Fresh out of jail with a new degree, Jimmy steps into the risky world of music Tupac, Biggie, and the East-West crew. Tupac's decision to turn down an offer from Jimmy Henchman, a known figure with a rough background, marked a significant moment in hip-hop history. This choice was influenced by more than just personal preference. It was deeply rooted in the complex relationships and power dynamics within the hip-hop community. These relationships were not just about friendships. They were also about survival in a competitive industry where who you associated with could affect your career and safety. The influence of Biggie Smalls, also known as the Notorious Big, on Tupac's decision cannot be understated. Despite their close friendship, Biggie's reluctance to associate with henchmen, likely due to his fear of the dangerous connections and reputational risks involved, played a crucial role in shaping Tupac's choice. This scenario wasn't just about making music, it was about navigating a landscape filled with potential threats and alliances that could make or break an artist. Henchman's proposal to Tupac involved a $7,000 payment to feature on a song by Lil Sean. This offer, however, was laden with implications. Accepting it might have seemed like a simple business move, but in the context of the existing East Coast-West Coast rivalry, it represented much more. It was about where Tupac stood in the ongoing conflict between the two regions, a conflict that was growing more intense and personal. The shooting of Tupac at Quad Studios later added fuel to the already blazing feud between the East and West Coast hip-hop scenes. This incident not only worsened relations but also turned the rivalry into something far more serious and dangerous. What began as competitive spirit in music escalated into real-world violence, showing how deeply the industry's conflicts could spill over into personal and physical confrontations. In this environment, Every decision made by artists like Tupac was scrutinized and loaded with meaning. Choosing who to work with, which offers to accept, and how to present oneself in public were decisions that could have far-reaching consequences. These choices were about maintaining one's image, securing one's position in the industry, and, importantly, staying safe amidst a backdrop of increasing hostility. Thus, Tupac's maneuver through these challenging waters was not just about managing his career, but also about handling the intricate web of relationships that defined the hip-hop world at the time. These were not simple friendships or business deals. They were strategic decisions that required careful consideration of both immediate and long-term impacts. This period in hip-hop history illustrates how the genre was more than just music. It was a complex social and cultural battleground where artists were forced to weigh every action and reaction. The decisions made during this time by figures like Tupac were reflective of a broader narrative about identity, loyalty, and the struggle to find one's place in a rapidly evolving musical landscape. This was a time when the lines between professional and personal were blurred, creating a fraught but fascinating chapter in the story of hip-hop. When Tupac Shakur needed money to pay for his legal troubles, he found himself at Quad Studios on a night that would later become infamous in the history of hip-hop. Alongside his friend Stretch and two other companions, Tupac encountered three attackers in the building's lobby. The encounter quickly escalated into a robbery, during which Tupac was shot five times. Miraculously, he survived this violent attack and quickly accused several prominent figures on the East Coast hip-hop scene of orchestrating the assault. Among those he blamed were Biggie Smalls, Sean Puffy Combs, known then as Puff Daddy, and affiliates of Bad Boy Records and Junior Mafia Tupac's public accusations 
added fuel to an already smoldering rivalry between the East Coast and West Coast hip-hop communities. His words not only stirred up existing tensions, but also transformed what had been mostly a musical and commercial rivalry into a deeply personal and public conflict. The implications of his accusations were far-reaching, turning personal safety into a pressing concern for those involved in the feud. The shooting incident at Quad Studios came to represent more than just a violent night. It signified a turning point in the culture of hip-hop. Previously, the East versus West rivalry had manifested through competitive tracks and verbal sparring, which, while intense, had not escalated to widespread violence. However, the aftermath of Tupac's shooting saw the rivalry take on a darker tone, with artists from both coasts engaging in a war of words that often hinted at more violent reprisals. This escalation was mirrored in the media, where the drama between Tupac and Biggie was frequently headline news, capturing the attention of fans and stoking the fires of division. Each new song, each public statement from the artists involved, was scrutinized for hidden threats or insults, turning the music scene into a battleground. As the rivalry deepened, it became a source of endless speculation and analysis within the music industry and among fans. The feud became emblematic of a larger struggle within hip-hop, reflecting unresolved issues around identity, respect, and power. The constant public bickering, the aggressive posturing in music videos, and the lyrical digs that artists exchanged were not just artistic expressions, but were seen as real threats that could escalate into physical violence at any time. Sadly, this toxic atmosphere contributed to the deaths of both Tupac Shakur and Notorious Big, two of the most talented and influential artists in hip-hop. Their deaths marked a profound loss for the music world and highlighted the dangerous consequences of their rivalry. The legacy of their feud serves as a dual reminder of both the creative vitality that their competition brought to the music and the tragic outcomes that can arise when personal and professional boundaries are crossed in such conflicts. Jimmy's big break in music slips away, changing his path in hip-hop history. The secret alliances shaping hip-hop. The impact of their deaths extended beyond their immediate families and fans. It forced the hip-hop community to reflect on the direction the genre was taking. The loss of such prominent figures under such tragic circumstances led to calls for peace and reconciliation across the hip-hop community, urging artists and fans alike to remember that, at its core, Hip-hop was about artistic expression and community, not violence and vendettas. Before the shooting that shocked the hip-hop community, Biggie had surprisingly asked Tupac to be his manager, hinting at a deeper friendship than many knew about. However, beneath this gesture, tensions were simmering. Tupac was suspicious of several individuals he believed were connected to a robbery that had nearly killed him. One of these individuals was Jimmy Henchman, whom Tupac openly criticized in his song, Against All Odds. In this track, Tupac vowed to get back at Henchman's crew for their involvement. The world of hip-hop often operates behind a veil of bravado and rivalry, and Henchman was quick to deny any wrongdoing. But the plot thickened in 2011, when Dexter Isaac, a former associate of Henchman's, decided to come clean. Isaac admitted that Henchman had paid him to rob Tupac at Quad Studios. This confession not only supported Tupac's previous accusations, but also shed light on the often hidden manipulations within the industry. Isaac's shocking admission detailed how he had been bribed with $2,500 to carry out the robbery, with the promise of keeping the stolen gold, which was worth about $35,000. However, he was instructed to return a specific ring that Henchman wanted for himself. Isaac also implicated Stretch, a friend of Tupac's who was present at the robbery, alleging that Stretch had been part of the scheme and had been given drugs to deceive Tupac. In his song, Tupac expressed his feelings of betrayal by Stretch, suggesting that Stretch's change of loyalty might have led to deadly outcomes. Despite Isaac's bold confession and the clear connections drawn between henchmen and the robbery, henchmen faced no legal repercussions for the shooting itself. He continued to deny any involvement in the violent act, although his credibility had been severely damaged. Jimmy Henchman's reputation for discord stretched beyond his feud with Tupac. He was also known for his ongoing conflicts with other major figures in the hip-hop world, including 50 Cent. This animosity extended to issues with the game, illustrating the complex network of alliances and rivalries in the rap community. The story of Henchman, Isaac, Tupac, and others 
is a stark reminder of the intense and often destructive dynamics that can exist beneath the surface of the music industry. These dynamics reflect a world where people are constantly jockeying for power and where loyalty can quickly turn into treachery. This tangled web of relationships shows how personal grudges and professional rivalries can intertwine, influencing the music and the lives of those who create it. The game was a key member of the G-Unit group, led by 50 Cent. However, as the game began to gain more success on his own, tensions started to rise. Many believe that 50 Cent felt threatened by the game's rising fame, fearing that he might surpass him in popularity, which is often seen as a trigger for their falling out. The situation was further complicated by the game's associations with some of 50 Cent's rivals. These connections did not sit well with 50 Cent, and were likely a major reason behind the game's eventual dismissal from G-Unit. Even after leaving the group, the conflict between the game and 50 Cent didn't just fade away. Instead, it grew, with both artists frequently attacking each other in their songs and public statements. The hostility spilled over into their personal lives during an incident involving Jimmy Henchman's son. Jimmy Henchman, a notable figure in the music industry known for his tough persona, had his own complex history with 50 Cent. One day, his 14-year-old son was seen by Tony Yayo and Ludi Mack, both associates of 50 Cent. The boy was wearing a shirt from Czar Entertainment, his father's company, although there are claims that he also wore a G-Unit shirt. The response from Yayo and Mack was far from welcoming. They mocked and intimidated the young boy, a move that seemed aimed at sending a message to his father. This petty behavior showcases the often childish and vindictive nature of some hip-hop rivalries. These disputes often involve more than just the artists themselves, pulling in their associates and even their families. The ongoing feud between 50 Cent and the game is filled with these types of indirect attacks, public taunts, and alliances that shift over time, mirroring a game of chess where each player is constantly strategizing against the other. This story highlights the complex dynamics of relationships in the music industry, where friends can quickly turn into foes and professional competition can lead to personal vendettas. In hip-hop, where your reputation and street cred are as important as your musical talent, these battles are fought not just in the studios but in the streets and the media. Each artist not only has to maintain their image, but also navigate the intricate web of relationships and rivalries that can define their careers. This saga between 50 Cent and the game, with its layers of alliances and conflicts, is a textbook example of how personal issues can escalate into public wars, influencing not just the careers of the individuals involved, but also the music and culture they represent. The rivalry intensifies, leading to violence that shakes the core of hip-hop. Crime's Invisible Empire In a scene straight out of a street drama, Tony Yao found himself constantly under threat. No matter what he wore, whether it was a casual shirt or something more formal, he was always a target. In a particularly brutal episode, Yao was cornered and beaten by rivals led by Yeo, who even handed a young boy a gun to use in the attack. Both Yeo and his sidekick were arrested and charged with assault, though Yeo's charges were quickly dropped, hinting at a potentially deeper issue with how justice was being served. But even as Yeo's legal troubles vanished, the violence didn't stop. In a terrifying escalation, gunmen opened fire on Yeo's mother's apartment where his sister and niece also lived. It was nothing short of a miracle that no one was injured. The incident left deep psychological scars on the family, though, and highlighted the ongoing danger they lived in. Lomac, who was also involved in the initial assault, ended up admitting to his part in the violence and was sentenced to several years in prison. Ironically, being in jail probably kept him safer from the street violence that was only getting worse. The cycle of attacks continued relentlessly. Despite his legal victory, Yeo's home was targeted in a shooting, underlining the fact that the feud was far from over. Jimmy's crew, who opposed Yeo, were determined to keep the pressure on. They even attempted a bold move by showing up armed at a music video shoot where Tony Yeo and 50Y were working with Aiken on a new song called I'll Still Kill. They came prepared to do serious harm, with guns equipped with silencers to avoid drawing attention. But by some stroke of luck, one of their guns misfired before they could carry out their plan, and they were forced to flee the scene in disarray. This ongoing cycle of retaliation highlights the brutal reality of street feuds, where every day can bring a new attack, 
and people live in constant fear for their lives and the safety of their loved ones. The law sometimes steps in, but often it feels like a temporary fix, unable to stop the next round of violence. In these neighborhoods, the line between friend and enemy is thin, and allegiances can change quickly, adding to the instability and fear. As each incident unfolds, the community is left reeling, trying to find a way to live with the ever-present threat of violence. The real cost of these conflicts is immeasurable, not just in terms of the immediate danger, but in the long-term damage to the fabric of the community, eroding trust and hope for a peaceful future. The scene was more awkward than deadly, with plans gone awry on both sides. A henchman had left important documents at the scene, setting the stage for what should have been a violent confrontation. Yet, when the time came, a malfunctioning gun and a well-positioned guard turned a planned attack into a fiasco. The attackers, perhaps embarrassed, quickly retreated. They had come prepared with silenced weapons, ready for a silent confrontation that fizzled out before it even began. Luckily, nobody was hurt because one of the attackers didn't even know how to use his weapon properly. Despite this clumsy skirmish, the troubles involving the henchmen were far from over. His criminal activities continued to unfold like a badly scripted drama. Lo Mack, who had just been released from prison in 2009, was shot in a Bronx street just weeks after his release. The street buzz suggested that the henchman was behind this, an accusation that seemed likely as more of his dark dealings came to light. By June 2010, the henchman found himself behind bars, faced with a slew of charges that painted a picture of a major criminal enterprise. He was accused of distributing cocaine, laundering money, and tampering with witnesses. His criminal operations were reportedly vast, spanning from the west to the east coast of the United States. He supposedly managed a drug ring that would have impressed notorious drug lords like Chapo or Pablo Escobar. This ring allegedly funneled drugs from Los Angeles to New York, and then the money from these sales was sent back to Los Angeles. It was a well-oiled machine, pulling in over a million dollars a year. The scale and scope of his operations were vast, yet they lacked originality. They followed a tried-and-true formula for drug trafficking, one that emphasized efficiency and profit over innovation. In his quest for power and financial gain, the henchman orchestrated a continuous cycle of buying and selling, creating a flow of cash and drugs that never seemed to stop. However, such a high-profile lifestyle attracted a lot of attention, the kind that no criminal desires. His name became well-known, not just among law enforcement but also amongst rivals and potential snitches. This fame was not without consequences. As his criminal empire expanded, so did the target on his back. The bigger his operations got, the more scrutiny he attracted, making his downfall almost inevitable. In the criminal world, where staying under the radar is key to survival, his blatant disregard for discretion was his biggest mistake. His arrest wasn't just about the crimes he had committed, but also about the loud trail he left behind, which eventually led the authorities right to him. Each ambitious move he made only hastened his capture and the collapse of the empire he had built so painstakingly. In the end, his rise to infamy was as rapid as his fall from grace, illustrating that in the criminal underworld, visibility can often be more dangerous than any enemy. The Roseman organization, led by Jimmy Henchman, demonstrated a clever approach to avoid the usual risks associated with drug trafficking. They didn't rely on their own vehicles for transport. Instead, they cleverly utilized major delivery services like FedEx and UPS. By covering their illegal shipments with mustard, they attempted to throw off the scent of drug detection dogs, exploiting a rather unconventional method to shield their operations from law enforcement detection. Jimmy Henchman was the mastermind behind this scheme, but his clever tactics could not save him from legal repercussions. On October 25, 2013, he was sentenced to life imprisonment. The judge expressed deep dismay over the severity, duration, and impact of his criminal activities. However, the legal troubles didn't stop there. Henchman faced further betrayal when the hitmen he had hired to kill a rival turned against him, leading to an additional life sentence in 2014. Despite the gravity of their crimes, one might hesitate to sympathize with Henchman's followers, as rumors suggested that Henchman himself had been cooperating with law enforcement. These rumors were somewhat confirmed when public figures like rapper 50 Cent said that Henchman had acted as an informant. Such a role is dangerously controversial in the shadowy world of organized crime. It can destroy the trust and loyalty that bind criminal groups together, making it a risky move for anyone deeply involved in such networks. Informants often work with the police to reduce their own legal penalties, trading information for lighter sentences. 
What do you think about using legal loopholes in crime prevention? Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe for more discussions on intriguing criminal tactics.